great to be here worshiping with you all. This morning continues our series. If you were here last week, we started a new, brand new series titled, What on Earth Am I Here For? Some of you say that every Sunday, but what we're talking about is not here. It's talking about here on this planet. Today we're going to be looking at week two of the, this question, why do I exist? What is my purpose? And to understand our life calling, to understand our life purpose, we must begin with God. You see, I can't tell you what you were created to do. To take it a step further, I can't tell me what I was created to do. Someone higher, better, bigger has to give us our purpose. I'm so thankful there is one, only one, who is greater than us, who can tell us what our purpose is. You see, only the Creator can give us our purpose. Last week, we went through, through seven different truths, seven different points that all said, all seven pointed you and I to the truth that we have a, pol- we have a calling, we have a purpose. Some of you may have left here last week excited. There's a calling. God Himself, the great I Am, has a calling on my life. And it finally clicked. It finally, you realize that God has a calling on your life. For years, you wondered if you really matter. For years, you've wondered, well, I guess I'll just get up and go to work. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Just day after day and just living your life. And you didn't realize you were here for a reason. That God has a purpose for each and every purpose. There, a person, there's a per- person walking outside right now, maybe. Say, why am I here? God has a purpose for that person. So you say, you may have left here Sunday excited, but then you may have also left here saying, well, wait a minute. Now what do I do? That's great. God has a calling. God has a purpose, <coughs> purpose on my life. Well, what is it? What am I supposed to be doing? What is it? Now what do I do? Over the next five weeks, we're going to look at five purposes, five callings, for your life. And we're going to begin with the first purpose. And the first purpose is for my life. We are to be loved by God. The first purpose in your life and the first purpose in my life is to be loved by God. The reason you were created, number one, is to be loved by God. You know, God made you for him to love you. Let that sink in. Take a second, just let it sink in that your first purpose is not to serve God. Your first purpose in life is not even to trust God. The first purpose of your life is not to obey God. The first purpose of your life isn't even to love God. No, the first purpose of your life is to let God love you. Now, all those things will come, but number one is to soak up the love of God. You know, God didn't create you in the first place to do something. He created you in the first place to literally receive something. Some of us, we've been in church our whole lives, and we we still have yet to grasp this revolutionary, transforming truth. And it'll change your life when you finally get it. That number one, you were created to literally receive the love of God. Your first duty in life is not to do something, it's not to learn, it's not to listen, it's not to pray, it's not to give, it's not to sacrifice, it's not to serve. Those are all good things that we'll talk about later. Those are all good things that we do in our walk with God, but that's not number one. He created you to accept, to receive his love, to literally just let God love you. That's the first purpose of my life, to be loved by God, amen? It's amazing. And if the first purpose in my life is to have his love on me, surrounding me, that means our first calling is to enjoy a relationship with him. You may say, well, what? yes, God himself, the great I am, as we just said, wants a relationship with you. You may be surprised. With me, kind of the first time Michelle, and I was like, like you sure, Michelle, me? This one? It's like, Wow. Now, I don't have to say that because she's here. <laughs> I mean, that, that may get me some brownie points. That's, that's not, I won't joke there, but 
when we realize that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of our last breath wants to have a relationship with us, it should stir us every single day. Our purpose is to let God love us, but our calling is to enjoy a relationship with him. That's, not, that's your number one calling. It's not a role. It's not a responsibility. It's not a bunch of rules. It's not a bunch of regulations. It's not rituals. It's not religion. We try, sadly, Southern Baptists try to make it all those things, but it's none of it. It's a relationship. It may surprise you that Christianity is not a religion. We try, like I said, we try to make it a religion. We try to make it about a bunch of to-do, we gotta do this, bunch of church check. No, it's not about that at all. Jesus himself said it's a relationship. God sent Jesus to the cross so that you could have a relationship with him. And he wants you to experience that love. He wants you to experience him. So what kind of relationship? What kind of relationship are we talking about here? Does God want you to be a slave? Maybe his servant. Maybe God wants you to be his soldier and fight his battles for you, for him. God wants you to be his warrior, maybe his worker, maybe his employee. Maybe the, young, the younger kids think that God wants, wants us to be his minion, right? And once again, God uses those things, and those are roles that we do take on at times. But number one is God wants you to be his son or his daughter. And as a son, as a daughter, it's a privilege, like I said, to do some of those. But number one is to be part of God's family. Paul says in Romans 1, 7, says, I'm writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and who are called. You are called to be his own holy people. That's what this whole series is about. That's what the next five weeks is about. We have a calling. We have a purpose. And this morning we see our purpose is to be loved by God. Our calling is to enjoy a relationship with him. But what type of relationship does God want to have with you? What type of relationship does God want to have with me? He wants me to be his son, co-heir. I am his son, his daughter. This is one of the most amazing truths, probably the most amazing truth you will ever hear in your life. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe doesn't want you to be a slave, his servant, his soldier. He wants you to be his son and his daughter, his child. God has a family and he wants you to be a part of it. First John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. Now another translation of the Bible, don't use this one often, it's called the Amplified Bible. I like the way it words. It says this. It says, what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us, that we should be named and called and counted the children of God, and so we are. I love the wording of that second verse. Here we're named the children of God. Here we're called the children of God. We are counted the children of God. You know why? Because we are. We are the children of God. Your number one purpose in life is not to accomplish something. Your number one purpose in life is not to make something of yourself. It's not to make lots of money, to be famous, have lots of fun. Those things may happen, but that's not your purpose. God called you. He created you to be loved by him, to experience his love. And I really believe that most people have never truly experienced the love of God. If you stop and think about it, have you really experienced the love of God? Well, of course, I'm a Christian. Of course, I've experienced the love of God, right? And we've all heard it, too. We've all heard it time after time after time. Everyone say, yeah, oh, I know, I know. God loves me, I get it. And then move on to something else. What were you saying? Things like that. The fact that they're bored with it proves they don't get it. The fact that, oh, I'm loved by God, oh, that sounds, that's cool doesn't excite them anymore. Maybe they've never really experienced it. That's my thought. There's so many people that are going to miss heaven by about 18 inches. So they have it up here. You know, if they were on like a Christian jeopardy, they, they, they blow everybody else away. They know everything. They have it here. Or so close, isn't it, to right here where it really matters. 
We've got to experience. We've got to know. We've got to possess the love of God in our heart. You see, God's love is extravagant. God's love is lavish. God's love is literally beyond comprehension. He loves you on your good days. He loves you on your bad days. He loves you when you you think he's right there and you can feel it. And then he loves you when you think he's millions of miles away. He loves you every single moment. And you can't. You can't make God to stop loving you. God will never love you any less than he loves you this very second. God will never love you any more than he loves you this very second. Because you see, God's love isn't based on what you do, what your credit is, what you do for a living. You see, God's love is based on who he is, his qualities, his character. And the last time I checked, the Bible says God is love. It doesn't say God loves. No, it says God is is love. He is literally the definition of the word love. That is our God. Amen. And I'll say it again just so, to make sure we got it this morning. It's our number one calling in life as a Christian. Not to do something. Not to impress God. Now it's great. I think, I think we're all called to serve. I think we're all called to get involved like that, some of those things in the list. But that's not number one. Your number one calling in life is to receive something. To let God love you. And I wonder as we dive deeper this morning, you know, sometimes I wonder, do we really understand God's love for us? Do we really know all about the love God has for you and me? Did you know that God's love is wide enough to be everywhere? And I mean, literally every single place. There's no place on this planet that God's love cannot be found. Last night at the bar, Tonight, at the bar, when there's going to be people there trying to drink away their problems, God's love is there. In the red light district, when people are literally are selling their bodies for money, God's there. From the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich, God's love is there. And just because you may not see it, just because you may not feel it, does not mean it's not there. There's so many things that you and I can't see that are just as real as you and I. Right now, going through through the air right now, or radio waves, right? That's how you're able to hear me without me screaming. They're going going right through you, aren't they? Right? Going right through you. There's television waves carrying images all over the place, right? You can't see them. You can't hear them unless you're, you have a receiver and you're tuned in. But they're just as real as you and me, right? You know, we can't see God, but he is here. He is alive. He is real. And if you tune in, if you tune in, you will experience him. You have to get, you see, you got to get on God's wavelength. And then you will experience his love. You know, he will is, be as real as I am real standing here right now. But you've got to tune in. And just because you can't feel him, just because you can't see him, does not mean he is not there. I can't see those radio waves, but you can hear me loud and clear, can't you? You can't see an atom, but everything in life is composed with atoms, or composed by atoms. So how wide is this? How wide is this love we're talking about? There's no place you can go and not find God there. You may sit here today and you may say, you may have a smile on your face and you say, I'm so lonely. I'm so much in pain right now. But let me encourage you, you will never, 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 never be alone. I may not be there, your family may not be there, but God is there. No matter what's going on, there may be no person there, but God is there. And his love is wide enough and it is everywhere. Not only is it wide enough, it's also long enough to last forever. You see, God's love is different than ours, thank goodness, right? Our love fades, sadly. Our love is usually conditional. Sadly, that's where you see the problems in our world today, problems such as divorces, breakup, conflict in our world today. That's why there's 
people who they, they don't talk to that person anymore. Something small probably blew up, and I'm not talking to her anymore. I'm not talking to him anymore. And you say that day one, but 10, 20 years ago, and you still, whatever reason, you're not talking to that person. That's our love. That's human, conditional love. But God will never, ever, ever stop loving you. Even if you today, you say, you know what? I've been here 10, 12 weeks, and I give up on this church stuff. I give up on this Jesus stuff. And you say, I'm turning my back, and I'm rejecting God. To the day you die, even beyond that, really, God will continue to love you. He will still be there. His love is eternal. He made you. The purpose you're in this room, the purpose you're alive, the purpose I'm alive is because God made me to love me. And that love is long enough to last forever. It's wide enough, it's long enough, but it's also deep enough to handle anything. No matter what pain you are going through today, no matter what problems you're facing right now, God's love is deeper. God's love is deeper still. You may say, you know what, you don't understand. You don't understand. I'm literally at rock bottom right now. There's nothing, I, I've tried everything. There's nothing I can do. I'm at rock bottom. And I feel like I'm literally in a pit of despair. You may say, I can't get any lower than I am at this very second. Well, let me tell you that God's love goes deeper. God's love goes lower than any problem any one of us could ever have. Deep enough to handle anything. God's love is deep enough, but I wonder, is it high enough for us? God's love is high enough to battle through my faults, to handle my mistakes through Jesus Christ. God handles my faults, my failures, my sin, my rebellion, and on and on it goes. God offers forgiveness to you, to me, through the cross, all because of his love. He offers you a new beginning. You may say, you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand my past. God offers you today a brand new beginning, a brand new start, a chance to start over. You know, millions of years ago, before anything existed, God already had thoughts of you. Think of that. Millions of years ago, God had you on his mind. It's amazing, isn't it? He chose, even though he knew what was going to happen, he knew all the mistakes I was going to make, he still chose to love me chose to love us. And God has been waiting for you for your entire life, for this moment where he can get you to sit still, if you're like me, where he can finally get us to sit still, to stop, just so he can say, I love you. Amen. Jesus himself cries out to us saying, you have no idea, you can't even begin to fathom my love for you. I was there the moment you were born. I planned your birth. He said, I, God says, I allowed that conception to take place. I wanted you alive so that I could love you. I saw you formed in your mother's womb. I saw you take that first breath. I heard that first cry. You can just picture God saying, it was music to my ears. Maybe not anybody else in that room. But God says, to my ears, that's beautiful music. Maybe not a mother who's been up crying and <laughs> for 18, 20 hours. That's not music to her ears. But to God's ears, that's beautiful. And God says, whether you realize it or not, through all the sin, through all the mess-ups, through all the failures, he says, I've always gazed on you with love because I'm so deeply in love with you. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. How would your life change? How would your life be different? How would you be transformed if you began to actually be aware of this unconditional, this continuous, this never-ending pursuit of you? God's pursuit for you. How would your life change if the second you woke up, that moment you woke up, the first thing that popped into your mind was that I am deeply and unconditionally loved by God. As you're getting ready for work, as you're getting ready for school, brushing your teeth, eating breakfast, whatever it is, once again, it pops into your mind. 
God's amazing love is covering me right now. As you're hanging out with your friends, spending time at work, driving, whatever you're doing, every second, what would it be like if you were aware of God's unconditional love surrounding you? There's a few things I would like to point out to you that I think would enlighten us about God's love. And the first one says, if we were aware of God's love, we would feel accepted rather than ashamed. You know, there's a lot of people who go through life avoiding God, avoiding the things of God. They feel judged. They feel guilty. Why in the world would I want to worship? Why in the world would I want to hang out with a perfect God who knows all of my faults? It's going to remind me all the time of all the things I've done wrong. Why would I want to be a part of that? Why would I want a God that continues to push all my failures in my face? And the reason you want to be a part of it is because that's not how God is at all. You see, Jesus himself says, I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You and I, in all of our sin and disgustingness, to make that a word, we have been made acceptable. God accepts me now as a Christian completely, totally, unconditionally. Why? Because now, since I accepted his free gift, now I live in peace with God. Doesn't mean I'm not going to make mistakes. Hey, I do those all the time. But when we realize that God loves us unconditionally, we realize that we don't need the approval of other people, right? We don't need to make this person happy. I don't need their approval, but whose approval I do need is his. If we're aware of God's love, God's love for us, we would be bolder in bringing our needs to God. You know, as a Christian, I'm a son of God. You are a daughter of God. You have total access because he loves you that much. God doesn't, when you approach God, say, listen, I need, I need this. He doesn't sit there, no, wait, Ted, hold on. There's five or six other people ahead of you, and you know, look, flipping through his calendar saying, Thursday in October, I can pencil you in. That's not what God's doing. You can come boldly, right this second. You can come boldly to God anything, anytime, anywhere. God's not going to say, excuse me, I'm talking to somebody else. That's not going to happen. Because he's there waiting for you. He's there waiting for me. Andy, I'm here. Andy, I'm here. I know you're letting the busyness, because that is what I struggle with, you're letting the busyness get in the way again. I'm right here. If we're aware of God's love for us, we'll have peace when pain comes. We'll have peace in the pain we don't understand. You know, you and I, we're going to have a lot of things happen to us, around us, in our lives that we do not understand. We spent a lot of time talking about the why question through many sermons and many classes. But that doesn't mean you're not going to ask that question. There's, we're going to ask the why question. God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to our family? Why here? Why now? Why this? And we've all asked those questions before. But do you realize you don't have to understand something to be at peace with something. You know, my grandmother passed away about six, seven months ago, and if I, if I knew why, if Jesus says, here it is, this is why, that explanation doesn't give me peace. When someone you love dies, if someone would give you an explanation for why that person passed away, that's not going to comfort us. We don't need an explanation. What we need is the presence. And it's not, there's only one person's presence that really can comfort fully, and that is Jesus Christ. He uses you. He uses us when we go and co try to comfort people. It's not us, it's God working through us. You see, what we need is what the Bible calls the peace that passes all understanding. Philippians 4, 7 says, the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God's love doesn't keep us from suffering like 
others. We go through the same problems that people who don't believe at all have. We'll go through those same problems. The difference is we have peace that passes all understanding, where I can trust God with everything. When everything is falling apart around me, I can still have peace knowing that I'm safe in his arms. If we were aware of God's love for us, lastly, we would worship instead of worry. To worship, I've never heard that word, but what is worship? Worship is simply expressing my love for God. Anytime you say to God, I love you, God, you are worshiping him. You can worship him as we are right this second. In a few minutes when you leave, maybe you blare the radio, you can worship God at that same exact second. Any time you express your love to God, you are worshiping, but never miss this. Worship is a response. Think about that. Worship is a response. You see, we worship, we love, we adore God because he first loved us. Our worship is a response of all the amazing things that God has done, but also worship is a response of who God is. It doesn't have to have the huge list. It also can be just worshiping the presence of God. Sometimes our biggest problem is not us loving God, but the biggest problem is us forgetting how much he really loves us. Instead of worshiping, we begin to worry. That's, I'm a worrier, sadly, and this happens to me. Worry, when you worry, you're pretending like everything is on your, when you're all on your own. Everything's on your shoulders, when in reality, it's not at all. Worry means I've forgotten how much God loves me. You and I need to choose worship over worry. And I could ask a few of you, and you'd come right up here saying, let me tell you about how I started worrying way too much, and you could tell your story, and a lot of us could do that. But we need to choose to be men, women, children, teenagers who worship instead of worrying. As we close this morning, last week, if you were here, we saw that we have a purpose. You realize you and I came to the conclusion you have a purpose in life. You have a calling. And this morning, we spent all morning looking at number one. The first purpose you have in life is literally to let God love you. First calling is to enjoy a relationship with him. We've talked a lot, I mean a lot, basically all morning, about the love God has for us. And I pray that you have experienced that love. I pray you never get over it. Never get over the love that God literally pours on you. This very second, the love of God is surrounding and being poured on each one of us. And I pray you've experienced it. I pray you never forget it. Maybe you've been a Christian for 20, 30, 50, 8, whatever it is, years and maybe today you say, you know what? I need to go back to remembering my first love. I need to go back to that moment when I was excited about the love of God. I've become calloused. Yeah, yeah, God loves me, I know. And you've let, you've let the church and the busyness of life and the tactics, the smooth tactics of the devil chip away at that excitement. I pray today, if you are a Christian here today, that you will finally remember that first love, Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian here today, I pray that you will today, this morning, experience the best love of all. The love that goes beyond words the one that loved you, as I said a moment ago, millions of years ago, the one that saw, the love that saw you being formed, allowed you to be formed. And then when you were at the lowest point of your life, whenever that was, maybe it was last week, maybe it was 20, 30 years ago, when you were at that lowest point, God still, he was the only one, but he still stood there with arms wide open saying, I still love you. I'm still here. Maybe someone needs to today turn around, get off the ground, get out of the pit, turn around and grab hold to the one who will never let go. Humans, we'll, we make mistakes. You know, we make mistakes. Sometimes we'll let go. But there's one who will never let go of you. And his name is Jesus Christ. Let us pray.
Father, we come to you this morning, and I just am so in awe of the love that you have for us. Father, I ask that you forgive me, because there's so many times that, just like I said, yeah, I know you love us, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I let it become routine, mundane. Father, I pray that for me, for all of us, Father, you never, ever let it become routine in all of our sin and guilt, you still, Father, you still put your arms around us and love us. I personally cannot fathom that. And we are forever eternally grateful for that. It's in your beautiful, it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.